Home Assistant has gotten so much more accessible for new users over the last few years and more and more people than ever are jumping in and getting started, which of course we love to see. But there's also been a lot of new features and changes in that same time period too. So today I want to give you 12 tips and tricks to help kickstart your Home Assistant adventure for those of you who are just getting started and maybe even for some of you more advanced users too. The first tip I have for you is one of the first things you'll run into when you start using Home Assistant and that is that you should use a standard naming convention. You see, when you start adding devices to Home Assistant, every device naturally has a name that you will use when you create an automation or build a dashboard. And in the beginning, when you don't have many devices, you can usually get by by just using the default name. But when you start adding more and more devices and your smart home starts to grow, suddenly those default names can get really difficult to manage and remember. So adopting a standard naming convention out of the gate is a really good habit to get into and will save you having to go back and tediously rename all of your devices later down the line. There are actually kind of three ways to name devices in Home Assistant and the OCD in me recommends doing all three which are the device name itself, the entity friendly name and the entity unique name. If you go into settings and then devices and then we pick a device to rename, up at the top left you will see the device name. That's the name for the device as a whole which houses or groups many entities and it's useful to set a good name for this because in automations you can reference a device as a whole. Hit the pencil button in the top right and then you can edit the name and for these names I typically go with the name of the room and then its function so something like bathroom fan or living room lamp something like that. If you have multiple of the same devices in a room, then you could also optionally add something like living room table light or living room sofa light. Just something that makes it immediately obvious to you. When you do this, it may ask you if you want to rename all of the entities and you can likely go ahead and hit yes to this. The next location to name things is the actual entity itself, where if you click the entity and then hit the cog, you will see that we have the friendly name up at the top followed by the unique name underneath. The friendly name can again follow a similar convention to the device name and it's great to name this properly as it's the name that you will see whenever you are looking for entities to add in a dashboard or throughout the UI. Finally, the unique name is also important to set because although the friendly name is probably the most used inside of the UI, you will still run into the unique name from time to time, for example, when you're creating templates and if you have a good naming convention, it's very easy to guess the entity name you're looking for without having to switch tabs and go and look it up. For the unique name, I typically don't include the function since it's already included by default in the domain portion of the name. But again, just pick something that makes it sense and stick out to you and something that you can remember easily. While we are in the device page, tip number two also applies to devices and that's to remember to set an area. Setting an area is even more important now than it has ever been since recent updates have added things like the auto-generated dashboard settings and of course the voice assistant settings, both of which make heavy use of areas for targeting devices. Adding an area is actually really simple. It's either done when you initially add a device during setup and it'll ask you to assign that device to an area or if you forget to do that, you can always go into the device, hit the pencil and then assign an area which will also apply it to all entities to save you having to go through each one one by one. Next, tip number three is to save your future self and make sure that those backups are turned on. Backups are so important to everyone, but especially if you are a beginner because there's nothing more soul destroying than spending days getting everything set up just the way you like it, only for a bad SD card to wipe out all of your hard work and you have to start again from scratch. And free bonus tip, don't use SD cards in 2024, future self will definitely thank you. So backups are critical and easier than ever to do. It even prompts you anytime you do an update if you want to run a backup, which you should definitely always do. 
But being Home Assistant, of course, you can automate this on a daily basis. Creating a new automation for the trigger, you can add a time and enter, say, 9 o'clock, meaning every day at 9 a.m. this automation is going to run. And then for the action, you can select the Take Full Backup option and select any of the options you need, as, such as setting the name. Be aware that doing it like this, you will need to keep an eye on the storage space taken up to ensure that you aren't keeping really old backups for months, but this is a really good start. I'd also recommend going into the backup settings in Home Assistant and changing the storage location to a NAS if you have one for keeping them off of your Home Assistant storage in case you ever actually need to use them. There are also add-ons that can help you back up to something like Google Drive, which I've done a video on in the past, and I'll link up here. Kinda leading on from the last one, number five is to update. I feel like there's a bit of a stigma around Home Assistant updates that happened from way back in the day where things used to break a lot more, but honestly, these days, there's rarely no reason to just not update. Now, I'm not saying you need to update to every release as soon as it comes out, and in fact, if you're a beginner, I'd probably recommend playing it a bit more conservative and updating to a 0.1 or a 0.2 release where generally any minor niggles with integrations are fixed. But I wouldn't let it go six months, a year, two years without updating, which I'm starting to see a lot of more recently, as that is where you are way more likely to run into issues and have to work through lots of breaking changes uh, to get everything updated. So updating every month or even two months makes it way less painful in the long run. Next up is one that's a personal pet peeve of mine right now, and that's to stop using virtual machines. No, wait, hear me out Proxmox fans first. What I mean is a specific type of VM, which is found on type two hypervisors, and it's usually people using VirtualBox. Now, don't get me wrong, VirtualBox is amazing for testing out Home Assistant, seeing if you like it and if it's going to be for you, but it's really not a great option for long-term use, particularly on Windows where it just loves to reboot and just do updates at will. Now, by all means, use hardware you already have, but I'd recommend a Type 1 hypervisor like Proxmox, which is KVM, which will provide a much better and smoother experience for running Home Assistant on. So stop using VirtualBox, get onto something better like Proxmox. Number seven is to resist the urge. Resist the urge to install every integration and card in sight from the Home Assistant Community Store or Hacks. Now, Hacks is amazing and I would certainly urge you to check it out if there is something extra you need, but just try to keep cool, calm and collected while you're browsing through everything that's available because it's very easy to just get really carried away installing all of the cool things you see. I know I'm certainly guilty of that. But just remember, the more you install, the more Home Assistant will need to load up, which could potentially cause issues. So just keep that in mind to install only the things you need. And more importantly, remove the things that you no longer need to keep things running nice and clean. A very similar tip and number eight is to only install the add-ons that you need too. So again, it's very easy to see some really cool add-ons and start installing all of them before you are ready to actually start using them. But again, it will likely slow things down as these add-ons consume CPU and memory from your system. So just be really selective with what you install. And again, remember to remove anything you are finished with. I know I'm certainly very guilty of forgetting to remove add-ons that I'm no longer using. So just keep that in mind. Jumping back over to the organization side of things, number nine is to make use of the new categories and labels feature inside of the UI. Categories and labels were added recently, and it's not something you might necessarily need when you're first starting out, since you won't really have many automations and devices, but similar to the naming convention, it's one of those things that as soon as you start growing, you will be really glad that you have started using them in the beginning, so it's a really great habit to get into as soon as possible. Categories are really great for grouping similar automations or scripts together, to make navigating and organizing them much easier. So that when you do start getting into 50, 100, 200 automations, you can quickly find them, collapse and expand them, sort by them and so on. 
Assigning a category is easy. Just head into the automations or scripts menu, click the three dots on a line and assign a category. Once you've created a category, you can then bulk assign it by entering select mode, selecting the ones you want to assign and then clicking move to category. Once assigned, you can then collapse categories or use them in the filters as you need. Labels are a little different and appear in more places throughout Home Assistant, letting you apply them to devices, entities, automations, scripts, helpers, and even areas. And they let you filter tables again for organization purposes. You can even target a whole label inside of an automation. So for example, if you, if you label a bunch of lamps as say nighttime lamps, you can then target all of those lamps for a mood lighting automation at night. Assigning a label is just as easy and can be done by heading into the settings of a device, entity or automation and assigning a label. And unlike categories, you can assign multiple labels all at once. Once assigned, you can then also use it in the filtering options, just like categories. Jumping into number 10, this one is related to Assist, which is Home Assistant's voice assistant, and that is to stop exposing so much. Entities, that is. Assist is generally pretty good at getting what you're asking for, but occasionally it will pick up the wrong entity if they have similar entity names. So making sure you only have things exposed to Assist that you actually want to control is a great way to minimize those because Home Assistant by default will expose all of your entities to assist. To change what's exposed, head over to settings and then voice assistants and hit the expose tab at the top. Then either select an entity and untoggle the switch to do an individual entity, or you can enter select mode, highlight a bunch of them and then hit the unexpose button. Remember to only unexpose entities that you will never use with assist. On a very similar theme, number 11 is to utilize aliases within assist. Now, if you're like me, whenever you use voice, you probably find yourself speaking sentences in slightly different ways from time to time, or because you followed a standardized naming convention, which is good, but it might not be the best way to actually speak a device name. And that's where aliases come in, which essentially lets you remap entities to different phrases, which is also really useful if you have a multi-language household. To add an alias, simply hit an entity, hit the cog, and then click on voice assistance and add an alias. And feel free to add multiple aliases to cover all of your bases and anything you might potentially use when you're using assist. Finally, our last tip for today is to make sure you are utilizing blueprints for automations. Blueprints are a great way for Home Assistant users to share automations with other users. And there are tons of great blueprints out there. And what's great about blueprints is you can import a blueprint straight into your Home Assistant, fill out the predefined options and have an automation running in seconds. To use blueprints, head over to settings, automations, and then click the blueprints tab and then hit discover blueprints, which will take you to the Home Assistant forum where you can browse through all of the available blueprints from all of the community members. Once you find one that you like, copy the URL of the page and head back to Home Assistant, hit the import blueprint button and paste in the URL and hit import. Then simply fill out the options provided and follow the on-screen descriptions, hit save and then boom, you've just created an automation based on a blueprint in no time. Blueprints are a really underutilized feature, I think, and they should definitely help you to really bring up your automations in your smart home. That's all the tips I have for you today. I'm all tipped out. Hope you find this video useful if you are a beginner and even if you're more intermediate or advanced, maybe there was one or two things that you did find useful. Please do share some of your favorite or best tips and tricks for Home Assistant users down in the comments below. Share them with the community and we can all benefit from them. I've actually done a couple of these videos in the past, so if you even want more tips and tricks, then feel free to check out those videos, which I'll have linked down below. Thank you so much for watching. Drop this video a like and get subscribed, and I will see you in the next video.